famine. By the mid-1970s, the Somali Democratic Republic seemed close to conquering them all. Under its authoritarian president, Siad Barre, the country appeared to have wealth, progressive infrastructure, adequate food, and a high standard of education and medication. Strategically situated on the Horn of Africa, it was being wooed by the Soviet Union, China, and the USA. The enterprising Somali population, a beautiful race descended from Arabs and North Africans, were quick to turn this aid into progress, for although mostly nomadic, they were good at business and adapting to new ways. In the late 19th century, the capital Mogadishu, its name meaning seat of the Shah in ancient Persian, was being considered by the colonial powers. They all had designs on this region, commanding the southern approaches to the Suez Canal and important sea routes along the east coast of Africa. It was an easy takeover, for the Somali elders were happy to recommend being under the protection of any nation offering friendship, a characteristic which would one day prove a destructive cocktail. The Italians were the most avaricious. Since the late 19th century, they had been racing to incorporate the whole Horn of Africa in one big colony. Eritrea was already under their influence. However, France took the northwest around Djibouti, Britain the north, and the Italians the south, by far the biggest and most productive part. So southern Somalis learnt Italian and Italian commercial, legal and political practices, and in the north they learnt English and adopted British practices. A Somali's first loyalty is to his sub-clan then his clan, the basis of Somali culture, and these allegiances run deep. Minor disputes, once settled with clubs and spears, would assume horrific proportions with the introduction of modern automatic weapons. To the west, the nominally Christian Ethiopian Empire also had its eyes on Somaliland. They took over the Ogaden and Houd regions, which the Somalis considered their own. The dispute over these regions angered and intimidated future president Siad Barre. It would ultimately destroy Somalia. But anti-colonial rumblings had started long before his birth, and being a Muslim country, it was religion which started them in 1898. Mohammed Abdullah Hassan, dubbed the Mad Mullah by the British troops, declared a jihad against the Christian invaders from Europe and Ethiopia. A master tactician, he could not be defeated. He died in the influenza epidemic of 1920, shortly after British bombers destroyed his fort at Tele. The dream of a united Somalia temporarily died with him. With Somali resistance broken, the Italians developed plantations around the only two areas where there are permanent rivers, the valleys of the Shabeli and the Juba. Vast quantities of bananas, sugar and cotton were soon being exported to Italy under preferential financial deals. By the 1970s, bananas alone contributed 35% of Italian Somaliland's export earnings. The British, however, were less inclined to invest in a protectorate which they saw mainly as a source of food for their more important garrison across the Straits in Aden. In August 1940, the Italians captured British Somaliland, but seven months later, Commonwealth forces retook the territory, gaining Italian Somaliland, the Houd, and the Ogaden in the process. Most of the nation was now united, even if under the British. A regenerated mood of national awareness was soon disappointed. Once again, the Ogaden was the cause. Ernest Bevan, the British Labour Foreign Secretary, wanted Somalia to remain united, under the British, of course. Emperor Haile Selassie, not unsurprisingly, demanded in 1949 that the area be returned to Ethiopia. The US, wanting a base in Eritrea, agreed. 
The UK gave the region back, and the UN ruled that Italian Somaliland be placed under a UN trusteeship for ten more years, administered by Italy. Somalia was once again divided. The UN were to play another indeterminate role in Somalia over 40 years later. In 1960, the two colonies became independent and on the 1st of July that year, united to become the Republic of Somalia. At last, there was a prospect of a united, prosperous country run by the Somalis themselves. But many Somalis had divided loyalties between clans, generations and colonial influences. The armies marched differently. The legal and commercial procedures differed. And what would the official language be? Not Somali, there was no alphabet. English, Arabic or Italian? Adan Abdul Osman and his Prime Minister, Abdul Rashid Ali Sharmake, began to lay the framework for what would become a successful democracy. It worked. Why it worked is because uh, people felt that the partitions can be changed through a multi-party system. So in fact the people, or I should say not the, the, the people in the, who matter in the towns, who know what politics is, felt that through this political party they can change any leader they want. Meanwhile, a little-known army commander named Mohamed Siad Barre was becoming influential. Siad Barre, I could, I think, will all certainty, I can say, felt that he was the reincarnation of Mohammed Abdullah Hassan. Absolute reincarnation. More elections took place in 1968, won by Sharmake, an almost unique instance of a constitutional change of power in post-colonial Africa. It could not last. In 1969, President Sharmake went on a mercy mission to the northeast. He never returned. When a head of state is assassinated, it is very rare that there is not a political motive or, or a political explanation, but it may be well below the surface, it may be obscured uh, because of the interests of the parties or the importance of the parties concerned. Uh, it's easy to believe the current story that uh, a demented uh, soldier uh, made uh, a decision unrelated to political reality for personal or local reasons. But of course, we live in a period now when archives are being opened. And there is little doubt in my mind that the opening, for example, of the KGB uh, uh, archives will reveal uh, a greater depth uh, to, to these issues and uh, may throw some light in what historians have suspected uh, was uh, an implication, uh, an, an involvement uh, in uh, Siad Bale's uh, coup d'etat. It has been mentioned uh, as a possibility by several writers, but no one as to date has produced the hard evidence. But that may now be possible. A few days later, on the 21st of October 1969, Radio Mogadishu announced that Major General Siad Barre had staged an allegedly bloodless coup. Relentlessly making decisions, he quickly consolidated his position. Proclaiming himself president, he abolished the National Assembly and personally headed an appointed 25-member Supreme Revolutionary Council. Initially, the people supported him. Born in the Ogaden, he was an anti-colonialist. Many who hadn't supported the coup were detained, including then-Colonel Mohamed Farah Aidid, who had always distrusted Barre. An affiliation. It was a refreshing break with tradition but it would not last. Barre, then gaining aid by cleverly setting superpower against superpower, was trying to turn Somalia into a modern state. While the Russians provided arms and advisers, Chinese money and loaned workers built roads into the interior and along the coast, linking towns that had never before been easily accessible. His scientific socialism was not dogmatic and instilled a feeling of optimism. His limited nationalization was also initially unauthoritarian. I, I believe that Siad Barre never bothered to read what scientific 